Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be what? Amen. Amen. There you go. The Lord would say unto you, I am your shepherd, and if you would seek me, and if you would begin to follow me, I will lead you into green pastures. I will see to your needs. I will restore your body. I will cause you to begin to walk with revelation and insight to my word, saith the Lord. If you would not think of yourself, but you would lift your eyes up unto heaven, for once come your help. If you lift your eyes up to me, I will show you from my standpoint what I have for your future. Rejoice, be glad in me, saith the Lord, and stand for what I believe, and stand for what I've done, and stand. And having done all to stand, I say, stand, for I stand with you. Let's give the Lord a praise, huh? Amen. a series called Reigning in Life with Christ. Amen. Reigning in Life with Christ. And so in doing, in reigning in life, we don't reign out of our own benefit. We reign in Christ. Can you say amen? amen. And he says, how will he not with him give us all things? So we're going to go ahead and open it up to our opening paragraph, which is in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. And then we're going to go to our other scriptures. We're going to call this one, Having Our Understanding Enlightened. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of you work hard. Amen. So you know what it's like to be tired, right? You know what it's like to be at times worn out, right? So here you go. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Remember, religion is a false placebo of what our walk should be. In other words, if you're religious... You're going to feel like you're doing something, but you're not having a relationship with God. You're just in a works program. So you'll get burned out on it. Come to me, he said. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. Amen. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. There's the key. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Say amen, everybody. Amen. All right, so having our understanding and lightning, if you put up our other, our other scriptures, Proverbs chapter 2, I think it is. God wants us to really begin to see things the way he's going to do it in these last days. How many here you know we're children of light? That means that we should not be taken unawares about the Lord's approaching. Because we have God on the inside of us, he will spin and quicken us as he comes. So even Jesus, you might not know this, but I'll share it with you. Did you know that even Jesus doesn't know when he's going to come? Only the Father, which is kept in his own power. Why? Because I don't know about you, but I have a covenant with Jesus. So that means that if Jesus knew when he was going to come, I could talk him into telling me because I have a covenant with him. 
So even the father has not told Jesus when he's coming. He's going to just send him. But I want to tell you, when he does, you'll feel a quickening in your spirit. Unless you're completely backslid, which you're not going to be. You'll feel a quickening in your spirit. There'll be a little and you'll feel an excitement. Now, if you're really sensitive, that's beginning to happen all over the world. Two things are going on. The enemy is having his heyday and doing his thing. But God is moving with his people. Now, here's the enemy's trick. If he gets the church to look at what he's doing, they might miss what God is doing. Hello? And what God is doing is far greater. He's getting us ready. He's equipping us. He's helping us with his wisdom to be able to win souls and touch life. To be able, Sherry, to talk to your parents or, or relatives, someone that really will bless you. Say amen. amen. That's our mission. Really, if you think about it, God wants us to enjoy our life. But really, our life begins after we have done his great commission. I want to get this work done and get out of here. I don't know about you. Anybody else feel that way? I want to get as many souls as we can win. Many people turned on to Jesus as we possibly can turn them on to. And then one day, it might be just one person out here somewhere that says, Jesus, I want you as the Lord, my Savior. And God says, that's the last one. Bow! Amen. Meanwhile, you and I are to be listening to what God is telling us. So this little lesson is going to be a blessing to you. Say amen. All right, we got our scriptures up. Proverbs chapter 2, 6 through 11. This is dealing with the wisdom of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. Let me ask you. Thank you, Lord. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Knowledge is the accumulation of facts figures, places, and things, right? Gathering information, right? It's hearing, gathering. But wisdom is doing. Wisdom is the ability to know how to put together what you've learned to get the desired results. Everyone say amen. And you see, God wants us to have his wisdom because he already knows what you need of. And when we operate by the Spirit in God's wisdom, we know what to do and when to do it. Can you say amen? And besides all that, it's out of the hands of the enemy hearing any of that instruction. That's why God wants our, our eyes of our understanding enlightened. And then he says, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield, see, a protection for those who walk uprightly. He guards the past of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness, what it means to be right with God, and justice, knowing that God's always fair and just. Equity, that's called balance. Everyone say balance. Don't move it yet. I got two more words. Thank you. And every good path. How many want to be on a good path, right? All right, now you can move it. When wisdom enters your heart, who has Jesus in their heart? So wisdom has entered your heart, hasn't it? Remember this Old Testament. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, you want to learn about God. Then discretion, in other words, to be able to discern will preserve you, and understanding will keep you. You know, we talked about the other day the difference between judgment and discernment. Almost the same word. We have the right to discern if something's good for us or not. Say amen. But we have no right, right to judge somebody or to pass a sentence on someone. Say amen. What does that mean? That means, like, let, let's say I see Piggy, She's down where she doesn't need to be. And so I make a judgment saying, she's sinning. Did you see my statement? Mm -hmm. That's a judgment. And so we want to try to avoid that. I'm not trying to go. But see, God doesn't want us doing that. Because that puts us as the judge. And there's only one judge. Can you say amen? But we need to discern. 
Now, discernment would look at and say, well, Peggy doesn't need to be there. I'm going to go get out of my car. I'm going to go down there and say, Peggy, what's the matter? She said, oh, you wouldn't believe I dropped my wallet around here somewhere, you know. See, I would have misunderstood if I made a judgment. So don't become a judge. Discern what is good and evil. Everyone say good and evil. So we have the right to discern the food we eat, the right to discern the, the company we keep, right to discern the gospel we hear, say amen, but we have no right to judge another person or to judge something before it's time, say amen. All right, let me read my paragraph to you. Blessings to you, church family, as we learn about our eyes being enlightened. I want you, I'm going to, you're going to hear some things over and over again that will help you to get your mind enlightened. Let me share a couple of things. When Adam and Eve fell, they fell a long ways and into darkness. I call it, they fell out of phase. How many know that God is light? But now they became the opposite because when they committed high treason and they ate of the fruit, they were poisoned and the nature somehow of Satan got into their flesh, right, and worked its way finally to their spirit, and they ended up dying. God created man to live forever with him. Say amen. And we're going to live forever again. But what the enemy did is he tried to poison us and tried to turn us into a slave group and slave to his sin nature. Now, let me ask you, what is sin? It, it, sin is separation from God. Sin is making mistakes. Sin is doing the wrong things. Sin is walking around in the flesh, you know, upset and frustrated. But that's not really what the sin that God wants us to understand. The sin that, that we need to be careful of is not doing something wrong. Is the reason why we do something wrong. It's the very nature of Satan. So say sin is Satan's nature. That's why we can't go to heaven with sin. That's why we ask God to forgive us and cleanse us. And he keeps the blotter on us. Can you say amen? He keeps us cleansed. He teaches us how to rock right with him so that we're constantly cleansed. Can you say amen? But the nature of sin, Satan's nature, is in your flesh. That's why we age. That's why some people are born challenged. Some people without limbs and things, you know. All of that came through Adam's curse that was passed through the genealogy all the way down to you and I. So one of the things that happened was now the human race was subject to good and evil. Let me, when you get up in the morning and you walk through your day, what do you see? Good and evil. You see good things and bad things, right? You see positive things and negative things. And everybody say, oh, that's just awful. Why do we have Jesus? Jesus in our life is to help us discern and filter out the bad things. Can you say amen? When I look at you, I can look at your faults or I can look at the good things in you. Which one do you think I look at? Yeah, amen. Which one do you think God looks at? Amen. But what does the enemy keep you trying to focus on? All the things and your mistakes that you do. So notice that the sin nature is really talking about the enemy's nature in our physical flesh that works against us, makes us age, makes us get sick. And so that's why we take ourselves to God. We dose ourselves with God, not only to love him and worship him and say thank you and give him gratitude, but so he can cleanse and restore and get that junk off our flesh so it's shut down. Now, anybody here do, done gardening? I know I, my, my children do a lot of gardening down there and, and stuff like that. There's a thing you buy called preen that you put it on after you weed everything. You put it on the garden, and it keeps the weeds away. After you weed and everything, it keeps the weeds down and away. God 
you need to go in and get preened every once in a while. Can you see? Amen. So God can knock down the rebellious feelings of the flesh, that selfish feeling, nobody loves me feeling, you know, those kind of things. Those are all part of the nature, the fallen nature, that the enemy tries to keep amplifying in our life. Everyone say, walk not in the flesh. Say it. Walk not in the flesh. Have you ever wondered why our thinking somehow sometimes thinks like we got brain fog? Come on, you ever thought like you had brain fog? This is part of the curse, okay? Now, I'm not talking about tired brain fog. I'm just talking about you got up and you feel like your brain hadn't. You know, it's just kind of foggy. It's not clear. It's not concise. Okay? We're going to be talking about that. So I got some great things to share with you. I hope you're going to take notes. Satan, when Adam and Eve fell, Satan blanketed this entire world with a dark film. If I can, let me try to explain it. It's like a, a, a darkness that we can't really see the darkness, but there is a spiritual darkness all over the planet. Okay? And its job, it's called the mystery of iniquity. Its job, because it's part of Satan's kingdom, is to keep us in the dark. To keep things hidden from us. Hello? And everywhere you go, doesn't it seem like we're not quite knowledgeable? No, God is not hiding anything from us. And this is not God. It's the system that hides things from us. And did you notice know that, that system is compartmentalized? That the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing? Kind of like the military. You see, so if somebody blows it, the other part's not affected. But see, this is all the workings of Satan. He tries to put everybody in a compartment, in a, in a category, in a situation, and then he has us to look at those situations. I'm just talking about human beings generally. And we judge whether or not, and all of a sudden, now we're all in this skew of who's better, who's lesser, who's this, who's that. And you see, the focus is love God and brought down onto the earth, isn't it? If you get mad at somebody, is your focus on God? So on that person. So you see, Satan has a lot of tricks, but he only has the same ones. And only if we're selfish, only if we're just thinking about ourselves, are we going to fall into them. Everyone say, not me. All right, so let me give this to you. Our father, in his original design, made us to be with him as his family, to fellowship him with him throughout eternity. He put us on this planet to populate it, as new creations, as a new species of being, and then from the planet go out into the universe and just travel around like all of the other creations God made. Now, folks, I want to tell you, there's other people and things out there. We just never met them. And let me just tell you, they're not visiting the planet. I'm going to tell you, we're not being visited by the planet from out there. We're being visited by the one that Satan by the one named Satan that God has hidden for a while and kept bound. Now people are asking him to come out. God bound him, set him between what we call, I want to find the right word. It's a curtain. It's a spiritual curtain. And all those spirits and all those evil things he put behind that curtain. And the only one that can bring him out of that curtain is a human being practicing things that they shouldn't practice. Say, oh, me. And through the years, they have periodically brought things out of that that God hid away and kept them from us on purpose. And people, because of their no love for God and they're practicing the occult, they're bringing some of these spirits out from that realm. Only a human being can do that. See, the devil can't leap into your living room and go, "Uh -uh." we have to allow him to do that. We have to invite him to do that. I don't know any of you that would do that, right? Yeah, amen. But people do. And I don't want to go off on a bunny trail. They opened quite a big one in 1947. And then they opened another large curtain opening in 1950. And you can go through the stages of all that and see the different operations of the world system, how it's functioning and dysfunctioning. But yes, 
you and I don't belong to that kingdom anymore. Say amen. We belong to the Lord. We are affected by it because we see it every day, but our job is to discern what is good from what is evil. Can you say amen? And to partake of what is good. All right, so you and I need to be very, very, very exercised to discern the difference between good and evil and really not be moved by anything other than God. That's our goal. Say amen. Now, whether or not we can really do that, it's up to each one of us. Because it takes faith and belief. We're going to cover four areas. You ready? Number one, we were blinded by sin and the lies of the enemy. We're going to cover how that happened. Okay. Two, God's word gives us light and wisdom. We're going to show you how to do that. God's word gives us light to see the truth and his wisdom. Three, keeping ourselves exposed to God is what keeps sin down. You've been preemed. Can you say amen? Keeping everything down so that you can function with hope and with joy and with faith and you can grow in love and in light and flourish. Can you say amen? So keeping yourself exposed to God and then fourthly, live before God from the inside out. Christians haven't really caught this yet. I mean, we're catching it. We're hearing songs, breathing in God, breathing out God, Walking from the inside out, from the inside out, because the new creature is inside here. We, are, we shell the new creature with our flesh. This isn't the real you. This is a poor copy. An Adam copy. Come on, laugh at me a little bit. And yet, so I, think, I don't think I'm a poor, no, no. But see, you think about your flesh. God designed you. You were so beautiful and so bright. There wasn't one flaw, one scar, nothing, nothing on you in the original design of mankind. But it didn't work out that way, did it? So what do we do? We have to go to God and expose ourselves to God so he can lift our thinking. I believe God's spirit, and has worked with me, can lift your thinking and move the brain fog so we can see clearly now. We can begin to understand our future. Now, who holds our future? So who do we need to go to to find out about it? Okay, future is very important to a human being. If it wasn't, why are people trying to find out about the future every other way but going to God? They go to a tarot card reader, tell me my future. They want to read their horoscope. Notice, horoscope. Hello? And they're trying to know the future. You see what Satan's got them doing? And yet they can go to God. You can go to God and walk with God and he will reveal your future. And you know what he'll say? It's going to be good. Because if you keep me in charge of your life, I go before you. I clear the path. How many know he does that? Now, sometimes the path's not always clear. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because you didn't allow him to clear that one piece out of there. Now look at me that way. The Israelites are really having a problem right now with the Gaza Strip. Do you know why? Because they never got rid of the giant called Goliath's family. Joshua never got rid of that. And so that spirit controls Gaza. And that's why there's always anger and fighting and everything there. You got to get rid of the devil so you can have some peace. Can you say amen? Hope you're getting some out of this. All right. Live before God. So our first point, we were blinded by sin and the enemy's lies. And if we listen to him, he'll continue to blind us. All right. Go with me to Romans chapter 8, please. Look at verses 5 and 6. Romans 8, 5 and 6. Bless you. For those that live according to the flesh, that means your five physical senses, Set their minds on things that your five physical senses tell you. Set your mind on the things of the flesh. But these, but those who live according to the Spirit, notice the capital S, by the Spirit of God, walking by the Spirit, doing your best to walk by the Spirit, will think about the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. 
But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And you've heard my little spiel on carnal. Carnal means meat. And a carnal mind, it must be a meathead. So let's go on. My next scripture is in 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 17. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 17. Match that up with the one we just read. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Do you see what that says? It says the people that are not born again, and when they sit under the law, and when they go to churches that preach the law, there's a veil over them. In other words, they're still blinded. They're not seeing. Okay, but let's continue to read on. Okay, because the veils, okay, it says, and there's a blind veil over them in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. So you see what the enemy's doing? He's trying to get people to go back under the Old Testament, Old Testament practices, so they'll be blinded again. Hello? It just, it's just the way it is. God wants us to look to Jesus, put our face on Jesus, focus on the word and Jesus. Why? So we're not blinded. So the enemy can't get one over on us. Can you say amen? I love that. Amen. I tell you what, your walk could get so good, Satan has to ask permission. God, can I please afflict Tracy? And God will say, no. Okay. You see, the accuser accuses, doesn't he? And by the way, he doesn't accuse in heaven. He was thrown out of there. So he accuses from the planet. Can you imagine that? This little sawed off little runt going, God carries a real pest. Can I get him? Can I get him? Can I imagine Job? Now, folks, some people believe that God turned Job over to the devil. That is not what it says. Read it again. He says, Job's already goofing off. He's already in your hands. That's what he said. So Satan says, God, I must, I must have missed something. And he goes back over and walks around the hedge, doesn't he? Remember I told you you have a hedge about you? Don't rip it down by your negative, negativity. And that hedge. And there was an opening in Job's hedge. And the opening was his fear had opened it. That thing he said, which I greatly feared, has come upon me. Don't fear. Fear is not of God. Say amen. Fear is not knowing what the future holds. By the way, God holds the future and you go to God every day. So fear isn't, shouldn't be a part of you. Perfect love casts out fear and God is perfect love. So people who have problems with fear get closer to God. Get a little closer to Jesus. Get a whole lot closer to Jesus. Everything's going to be all right. Amen? When you're close to the Lord. All right, so it goes on further. It says, nevertheless, when one turns to Jesus, that veil is taken away from them. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Where does the Spirit of God dwell? He dwells in you, doesn't he? So you have liberty to make any choice you want. Satan can't force you to do something. God will never force you to do something. You can make a choice. Now remember, don't, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Hello? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you're supposed to do that something. Find out what God wants you to be doing. How he wants you to be doing it. So that you and him buddy up and become one-on-one. -on -one so that you walk in the light. You convey the light. You move the light. You do and you trail and you pray for people. And they're, <clears throat> they're healed by the light. Glory to God. I don't know about you. We've seen a lot of healings lately, haven't we? Getting you guys with God. God's just a healer. All right, let's continue on. So we know that sin will blind our minds, will shut us down. So you and I go to meet with God, and he cleanses us, and he preems us up. Can you say amen? And go with me farther down in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, same point. Verses 3 and 4. And, and this is another scripture to just shows us what Satan's trying to do. So he says, but if our gospel is veiled or cloaked, it is veiled but to those who are perishing, 
whose minds the God, see the little g, of this age, that's Satan, have blinded those minds who do not believe, lest the light, everyone say light, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. We're supposed to be focusing on Jesus. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we with an open face as beholding in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image. So if we're focusing on negative all the time, then you're going to have a negative attitude. If you're focusing on Christ, he's going to continue to work with you, restore you, build you up. Even if you have some setbacks, they're not really setbacks. They could be an adjustment. Hello? Sometimes God has to put something under your feet before your next step. So, you know, don't be in a hurry. God's never in a hurry. But follow him, enjoy him, walk with him, amen, as a sheep with his shepherd. Amen. Now, I can see Jesus with you. And, and say, I can see us as a sheep. And we're kind of getting a little hungry, so he reaches down, grabs some grass, and puts it in our mouth. Says, so you come follow me. I got some things to show you. We need to fall in love with God. We need to just fall in love. You know, if he can be your, and, and God for, forgive the phraseology, I look for phrases. If he could be your secret, your secret boyfriend, where, you know, nobody else can see him, but you and God are palling up. You know what I mean? I mean it within reason, you know, nothing questionable. Can you say amen? Why? Because when you get like that with God, God warns you about problems before they come. God tells you what to be doing so that when they do come, you're prepared. Come on, say amen. That's what a friend does with a friend. Amen. But if we only visit God once in a while and we're always looking at everything else, he's got to go get our attention again. Woo-hoo, woo-hoo, I'm over here. Say, oh me. Couple of points, okay? So if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those that are perishing. That's why we go and we share the gospel. Good news. You don't tell a sinner you're a sinner. You tell a, a person that is in sin, there's hope. God's got something for you. And you're going to want to say, they're going to want to say, oh, I'm just too bad for God to save. Oh, no. He loves those. The bad guys are the ones he uses the most. He I forgave most will love me most, Jesus said. Are you with me? Let's go to point two. God gives us light to see the truth. God's truth is hidden in the world, but revealed unto his children. And it's revealed by the light. And it says God is light. Can you say amen? But let's look at what he has to say in this particular deal. Go with me. Psalms 119 verse 105. Short scripture there. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you remember camping and having no flashlight and you had to go to the outhouse, you need a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And then two, the scripture here is Psalms 119 verse 130 says, the entrance of your word gives us enlightenment or gives us light. So get into God's word opens our eyes to see it from God's perspective and enlightens our understanding. Can you say amen? The devil doesn't want us to know God's wisdom. But you know, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough. It's really tough. Next time the enemy tries to tell you about your life, remind him about his future. Say, I can smell flames and he'll just buzz right out of there. But do it confidently, you know. I watch people rebuke the devil, and they'll rebuke him, and, and they'll take authority of him, and then they'll stand up and go, I wonder if he's gone. People do that with their healing, too. I'll pray hands, and God, the healing come right away. But immediately, their head will tell them, check it, see if it's working. Anyway, I'm just throwing those out, no extra charge. All right, so... Go with me to 2 Corinthians. We got the two Psalms 119s, didn't we? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and verse 18. Those two scriptures. Are you with me? Let me know. Okay, it says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, 
The veil, or it's actually a napkin that goes over their face, is taken away. What did Moses have over his face when he came down with the Ten Commandments? A veil. Because the glory was so bright. Hello. And for a person that's not saved, they can't look into the brightness of God. There's just no way. But I got news. You and I are going to contain it. We're going to get that glory and we're going to be filled with it. Can you say amen? And to the enemy, we shine his lights and we blind him. So let's look at this. It goes, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. But we all with an unveiled face. See, we're free now. Who are we focusing on, Pastor Kerry? With an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror or a glass, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's very important that our focus be on God so that the Spirit of God can turn us into like Jesus types. Can you say amen? But if we're not focusing on God, we don't have our mind on things above. He can't enlighten us to see that image. And so we have nothing to work forward to. Faith is the substance of things we hope for or look forward to. Amen? So it goes on. Church, the word of God gives us God's perspective on everything and his wisdom on how to deal with it. Two, we are to study and show ourselves approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, being able to rightly divide the word of truth. You should be able to know what's of God, what's not of God. Say amen. What's a religious teaching, what's not a religious teaching. And there's a lot of religious teachings out there. You never know what God's going to do. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's only a couple places that say that you don't know what God's going to do. They're all Old Testament because they didn't know what God was going to do. But in the New Testament, but God shall reveal it to us by his spirit. Those that seek God. Amen. So guess what? God wants you informed. He wants you full of wisdom. He wants you to know what you're doing. And then he's going to back what you do because he's going to be right there doing it through you. Say amen, somebody. All right. Thirdly, the word is Christ, and Christ is his word. Don't separate them. When you speak the word, you're speaking Jesus. And when, when you speak Jesus, you're speaking the word. Can you say amen? So it's called a sword of a spirit. What's a sword for? Cutting. Yeah. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, the enemy is trying to mess with my family. Therefore, I speak your word in the name of Jesus. You cut on through him. I bind him up. And you don't have to be loud like I'm doing. I'm just emphasizing. And then you, once you release the word, the word is Christ. It's like a, a, a smart bomb. And it goes right over there and starts slicing him up and cutting him. He can't stop it. The word never returns to God void. It always accomplishes. That's why Satan tries to get us never to talk it. We're talking everything else. Amen. Third point, walking in the light exposed to God. Folks, I like to grow things. In the summertime, we have a, we have a little kiddie pool on, on an old table. And it's about a foot and a half high. And I fill it full of dirt, and we have tomatoes and peppers. And I know what it takes. You've got to have the nutrients. You've got to have the sun. You've got to have the right watering. And all those nutrients you'll gain up. Now, so when I first planted my plants, my pepper plants, they were real scrawny, scrawny looking things. I said, what's wrong? And God says, they don't have any nourishment. Your last group of plants sucked all the nourishment out of the soil. You got to put nourishment back in it. And folks, we're like that. Situations in, in, in life will drain us. We'll pull from, from the things and stuff we have. It's normal. But we always go to God to tank back up. Can you say Amen. Always go to God to take that. And if you, by, by chance, during the middle of the day, you feel less whipped, take a minute out, worship God a little bit, and get tanked up again. Don't sit there and say, well, I guess I'm coming down with something. Who told you that? 
Yeah. See, the moment you, you can start feeling when you might be coming down with something, that's because you're feeling the spirit involved. So bind and rebuke it before it has a chance to clam on you. And you get the runny nose and all that stuff. How spiritual do we feel about that? Amen. Now, so everybody gets those. But you have to learn what is of God, what is not of God. How to check it when it's coming your way. How to command it to go somewhere else and not land in your yard. Can you say amen? So walking exposed to the light. Light is a marvelous thing. The word light there, everyone say, luminous. It's a very special Greek word, which means that it has a multitude of faceted lights and quality. Did you know today we have certain lights that can tan your skin? Ultraviolet lights. Did you know that that same light can kill bacteria and, and all those things? So certain lights can do shades of light and light itself can do certain things. Just light itself. I mean, no, we can't exist without the sunlight. Hello. You walk around in your dark house, you turn on a... Yeah. So Jesus is our light. He's our eternal inside light. And he opens the eyes of our understanding. He helps enlighten us so that we don't walk around with a brain fog. There's a lot of Christians walking around with a brain fog. And, and they're not doing anything. They're just kind of existing. No, 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 no. Because you got to hold on, at least hold on. All right, let's move past. So in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, here's a key verse. Walking in the light exposed to God. 1 John 1. This is a message which we have heard from him, talking about Jesus, and declared unto you that God is what? He's luminous. And by the way, in a rainbow, how many colors are there? Seven, perfect, right? But you know there's far more facets than just seven. That's just seven we can see. But there's all kinds of different light. And if God is light, then there must be light that can kill darkness. There must be light that can destroy evil. There must be all these facets of God's light. Hello, right? And where is God dwelling now? In us. So how do we get the light out where everybody can see? Good, I'm glad you asked that question. So this is the message we heard from him and declaring to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So there you go. He is not anything dark, nothing to do with the devil, nothing to do with iffiness. He's good and perfect. Okay, good and perfect. And then it goes on further and it says, and if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk on in darkness, are you mad at somebody? Hello? Are you running around making up stories and talking and complaining? This is walking around in darkness. It isn't a terrible thing. It just brings darker. You, you bring dark or you bring light, depending on what you say. Hello, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that's just killing me. <laughs> Hello? So how we talk and everything depends on how much light and how much darkness is hanging around us. So, Lord, help us purge from our walk. Negative talk. Can you say amen? All right. Goes on further to say this. Listen. And it says, and have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. Do you see that phrase? People that walk on in darkness hate their brothers and, and do all those things. Say they're a Christian, but they're still walking in darkness. Instead of emphasizing the terribleness they're doing, they're just doing two things wrong. They're allowing the enemy to keep them dark and they're not practicing the truth. See what it says? It says they're, the reason where they're dark is they're not practicing. They're not practicing what it says to practice. Read it. It says they're not practicing. They walk, okay, it says they do dark. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ does what? The Greek says, is applied to us on a daily benefit. 
So you got a refreshing shower coming on. Every time you lift your hands, say, praise God. Somebody pulls in front of you, Sherry, and you're on the drive. Praise God. There's a washing, a cleansing comes over you. Every time you praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because you could be saying something else. So death and life are in the power of the? Death and life are in the power of the? How did you get Jesus from out here into here? By the power of the? That's right. So if you want to bring more light around you, what should you be talking more? All right, moving right along. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Same point. Verse 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says something beautiful. You are the light of the world. Now, Jesus is talking about the future. He says, you're going to bring enlightenment to the world. But also he's talking about when I die and rise again, you have me in your heart. You're going to be light bulbs in the world. People are going to come to you and they're either going to hate you or they're going to try to control you or they're going to want to know why you glow. And, and you tell them, say amen. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel or on a lampstand. They put it on a lampstand so that it gives light to all that come in the house. And let, so let your light shine before men that they may see what? The good things you do, your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You have a light bulb shining out of you. Satan can see it. We might not be able to see it, but others can actually see it. They can see the light shining off of you. Now, I told you that I'm a pastor. One of my gifts is discerning of spirits. And I can see your countenance. You want to have light coming off your countenance because you, that just tells the enemy, hands off, turkey. Amen. You don't want to walk around with your lip down, your head down, and oh, praise the Lord. Because you're, you're doing the opposite of what God wants you to do. Proclaim the light. Your city on the hill. Say amen. amen. All right, last point. Someone say last point. We live before God from the inside out. That's the key. Don't run on your emotions. Don't go by your feelings. Don't run on your reasoning. You can discern your reasoning, whether it's positive or negative. So heavenly mindedness is when your spirit and your thoughts work together. You become heavenly minded. Carnal mindedness is when your flesh and your mind makes excuses. Carnal mindedness. One will separate us from God. The other one will fill us with God. Can you say amen? All right. So we live before God from the inside out. Ephesians chapter 5, please. 8 through 14. Has this blessed you today? Okay. He says in verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Everyone say Amen. Walk as children of light. See, we have a choice. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, being good, all righteousness, being right with God, and all truth. Finding out what is acceptable to God. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them, it's secret. Do you remember a few years back, people were talking about all the nasty things everybody was doing? We're not even supposed to be talking about that. Why? Because it's not, it's not bringing any answers. Hello. And, and folks, back during these times where Paul is writing, they did some odd, terrible things. Threw their babies into false gods. Terrible things. And so to talk about those things and to talk about all the time will only bring darkness. Hello. So think about the devil. He's making all kinds of noise right now, isn't he? In our, in our nation, all kinds of noise. Hopefully that the church will lose their way and get to talking about all the things he's doing. Take a look. 
What's the church doing? They're judging and they're talking about this and everything. I mean, the enemy's crafty. We need to get our eyes off of what he's doing and back onto the Lord. Say amen. All right, so it goes on further to say, and for it's shameful to evil speak of those things which they speak in sickness. But in all things that they are exposed and made manifest by the light. Now, folks, I don't know about you. Have you ever had somebody get mad at you because you were happy and excited? You love the Lord and they're upset at you? I have. I had a bunch of friends. Maybe you had some friends too. And what I thought they were friends, but when the keg was dry and the pot was gone, so were my friends. And so I was a drummer in a rock and roll band. We were kind of getting famous. And so I ended up receiving Jesus and changed from darkness to light. And they wanted to kill me. I thought they were my friends. All of my hippie friends from... When I, when I did all of this stuff, and I lived, I lived in South Prairie for seven years. South Prairie at that time only had 450 people in it. So, I mean, they knew my dog. They knew me and everything like that. So we were all a bunch of hippie things. And so when I got saved, they all left me. Let me tell you, real friends will never leave you. They want to be excited about the God that lives in you. Say amen. Otherwise, they're just grasshoppers. Grasshopper friends. You know grass? They hop. <laughs> Some of you guys are so removed from that. Bless your heart. But that was just my whole entire life at one time. But thank God I'm saved. And you should be glad too. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians. Therefore, he said, Awake you who sleeps, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And we're finishing. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that the day should overtake you as a thief. See, you don't have to worry about when Jesus is coming. You will know. He will quicken you, right, just before he comes. Make sure you're following God, though. You're all sons of what? Light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So we're separated, aren't we? All right, so a couple of little points. Church, we are to be so well provided for and so well taken care of, we should make the world je jealous. And you know, the Bible says that, that when God blesses us, people want to know why. So don't be afraid of sharing why you're so blessed, why you have Jesus in your heart. And don't be ashamed to do it because might, it might be the last day that they're on the earth. Two, having put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we become equipped with God's ability. And that is why we sit down in God and we pray and we take authority over things in God's authority. We don't get all upset. We don't flash about. We just sit down in God's authority. And then if we have to fight anything, we just stand up and say, Jesus, get them. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, I never was taught in Bible college how to fight that way. I was always told to bind and rebuke, take authority, do it through this, fast and pray and do all of that. And one day God interrupted me. He says, son, what are you doing? He says, I'm having warfare and I'm taking authority over that. He said, I, I did that 2,000 years ago. Now, I want you to take my equipment, which is me and my equipment, and learn from me how to use it and put the enemy in his place where he belongs. Stop yelling and shouting and rebuking and put me on him. And when he told me that, it changed my entire perspective. Because we have God. We put God, we release God in our prayer. Can you say amen? I can't heal anybody, Tracy, but the God in me can. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I can give you. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord praise? Amen.